So, hi everybody. Um, in case you cannot hear me, in case I'm being too quiet, please just give me a shout. Um, I believe I'm obnoxiously loud when I yell anyway. Um, where's best for me to stand? This side? Okie dokie. Um, so yeah, hello, my name is Lisa Mayer. Um, I work at a place called Kodak with um, Kev over here, who I think you've all met, I'd hope. Um, so that's, that's me on a good day. Um, my preferred pronouns are she or they. Um, I'm a senior software developer at Kodak, so I work mostly in front ends. Um, I'm apparently the best front end developer that Kev knows, which is quite a claim to fame, I guess. Um, so I started off as full stack. I used to work in C Sharp and Angular, unfortunately. Um, primarily now I work with TypeScript and React, though currently we are dabbling with Svelte, which is actually very interesting. And I'm sure I can talk about that some other time if anyone cares. Um, I love functional programming. I run the F-sharp group at Coda. Um, if anyone likes F-sharp, like, can I get a woo for F-sharp? Woo! <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm here to tell you that F-sharp's great. Um, so if you want to talk to me about things outside of work, because I live outside of work, um, surprisingly, um, I like making things. So I like knitting. I love knitting scarves and hats for myself only for myself because nobody else appreciates them. Um, I like sewing, I like making outfits. Um, I love making PowerPoints, um, as I hope you will all see. Um, I went to RuPaul's DragCon UK uh, in January and I met uh, Lawrence Cheney. Uh, they were wonderful. And also I went to Svalbard uh, last year and I saw a polar bear. Because I saw more than one polar bear, which was quite fun. Um, so someone who is much cleverer than me told me that the best way to structure a PowerPoint is to put your conclusion last so people understand the goal of the talk. Uh, so the conclusion is property-based testing is a technique for testing statements of the type for all X that satisfy some precondition then some predicate holds. It can give you the confidence that your code behaves correctly across a wide range of inputs and it can help you find bugs in your code resulting from inputs you never would have thought to test. Okay, oh, last one. Uh, this can, technique can be used alongside existing unit tests. So um, thank you everyone for coming to my talk. Who wants to go to the pub? <laughs> Just kidding, I've got a lot more slides to get through. Oh my gosh. So question, uh, who knows what property-based testing is? Brilliant, so I can lie to you for the next 45 minutes approximately and you won't know any better. Fantastic, I cannot wait. So um, let's kind of talk about what about reversing a list. So you are a lovely little junior starting at my company. Um, we use functional programming, we use F sharp, and we use test driven development. Um, so I give you this, this kind of implementation to say, OK, we're going to write a list reverse function. For some reason, don't question why, we're just going to do it. Um, you look at this and you go, Holy moly, it's F sharp. I don't understand F sharp, but don't worry, don't worry. It's not so bad, I'll quickly run through it. So this is a function called list reverse. It takes a single argument, which is a list of integers. Um, it returns a list of integers and the implementation will go here. So F sharp is uh, a language, .NET language. Uh, you can use it with C sharp if you want to. Um, I think you should, but. I'm very biased. Um, so it's not so scary. I'm sure you could have figured it out, but it's worth going through. So I kind of appear and I say something that I can't remember. I say, I love test driven development. So we're going to develop this function using test driven development. So who likes test driven development? Got a few hands. Just so the recording knows, a few people did actually put their hands up. Can anyone give me a woo for software de test driven development? Yay, thank you everybody. Um, so test driven development, as I'm sure you all know, you write, the, uh, you write the tests first and then you use that to prove that your code is correct. So the test should represent the specification of our code essentially. Um, so we go away and we go, hey, let's write a unit test. So classic unit test, oh, I'm gonna test that it can reverse the list one, two, three. And I go, first of all, you look at this. Oh yeah, who wants to look? Who wants to read it? Because I know people like reading things when you put things on slides. So here you go. <laughs> so 
as you might have realized, this is the test that tests that reversing list one, two, three gives you the list three, two, one. Um, so, okay, just to go through it quickly, because you're like, ah, um, we're using n unit and fs unit. So, n unit, I'm sure you were aware, testing framework, fs unit essentially just gives you a load of nice f sharp friendly syntactic sugar on top. Um, this is the name of our test. Um, technically speaking, this is a variable which has got spaces and brackets and semicolons in. You can do that in F-sharp. Um, <laughs> next, we're just defining our test. So we're using, uh, so we're making a list one, two, three. Yes, you use semicolons as list delimiters in F-sharp. Don't ask me why they chose to do that. Um, we run it through our list reverse function and then we assert using standard library functions, oh, reverse should equal three, two, one. It's, you know, it is how it's written, basically. So that's what a unit test looks like in F sharp, if you've never seen one before. So we run it and it fails. It, brilliant, we haven't actually implemented it, that's what we expect. Um, let's also add a little test for the edge case, so reversing an empty list will give you an empty list. And let's go and implement it. So, I will give you a bit of time to think about how do you implement list reversal in F sharp? If this is giving you horrible flashbacks to university, I am very sorry. So, how do we implement this function? The answer is, of course, going to be that. For anyone who is not familiar with F sharp, what this means is uh, if the list is the list one, two, three, we're going to return the list three, two, one. Otherwise, we're just going to return the empty list. <coughs> so I run it through my unit test, my unit test pass, fantastic. Uh, well, sorry, you, this is you. Um, oh my gosh. Uh, you go and have a nap and prepare your, you know, your letter of please promote me to senior engineer because I'm really good at this stuff, you know? Later. I come along and I go, oh, I want to reverse the list 678. And it tells me that reverse of the list 678 is an empty list. And I'm like, eh, eh, why is this not working as I expected? Is it working as I specified, though? So what do I do? I say, OK, I'm going to add a case to my unit test. I'm going to say the reverse of 678 is 876. It passes, I give it back to you, you update your implementation. Brilliant. So you're probably sitting there being like, oh, this is stupid, this is ridiculous, no one would ever do this, blah, 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 blah. Um, I'm here to tell you that, you know, um, I'm a software developer, so I'm going to convince you this is an extremely logical thing to do. So let's go have a look at our best friend, Wikipedia. Uh, please don't read the whole slide. I'm going to zoom in on this one particular point. Um, so part of test-driven development, you write the unit test, and then you write the simplest code that passes the test. Oh, look, I even put a highlight on. Thank you, Pass Lucy. So if you were just given this, if you did not know it was list reversal, <coughs> if you're just given this mystery function, these three unit tests, and you're like, how on earth am I going to implement this? You might kind of sit there and be like, well, all I need to do is write some code to pass the test. And the simplest one is, of course, just a match statement. So we could sit there and we could fully specify the reverse function. We could write out the reverse for every single list that exists and is possible to represent, which is um, a very large number that I do not know what it is, but if you know what it is, then uh, please let me know. I, I don't even know if it would be possible to calculate that number, but anyway. The more cases we add to, to, the, to the tests, the more cases we can just add to our match statement. Um, and then, you know, funny tweets about programming, ha ha ha. Um, there must be an easy way to do this. Oh, check if it's even, if numbers one return false, if it's two return true, etc., etc., etc. So clearly this is not the right approach. Let's have a think about how do we define a function. Um, so typically you would do it by defining its behavior. So say for example, you had 
if we're trying to describe what reversal is this, you could say, oh, well, you take the items and you arrange them backwards. Can anyone see an issue with describing reversal like this? Pardon? What if you've got four numbers? What if you've got four numbers? I mean, still just writing it backwards is the same. But the problem is, reversal and backwards are kind of the synonyms. Like, I'm sure if you looked each of them up in the dictionary, you'd probably get like just a circular reference to each other. Um, so let's just think what would happen. Oh, I do apologize. Um, what would happen if you had to describe what list reversal is to someone who, for some reason, knew perfect English and understood lists and programming, but didn't know what reversal was? Not so easy, right? So we can define its behavior by identifying some properties of the function. So although it's useful to explain to someone like reversal, it's like, oh yeah, you take the numbers, then you like, you put them backwards, so one, two, three becomes three, two, one. That's not a very general approach, and you could get someone who just thinks that, oh, it's just a match statement. So if we look at properties, that is, for all x that satisfy some precondition, some predicate holds. So, do, 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 what are the properties of list reversal? We have got, for all lists, reversing it twice will give you an equal list. For all lists that are non-empty, the first item in the list will be the last item in the reverse list. Likewise, the other way around, last item will be the first item in the reverse list. You could also say for all lists that are palindromes, reversing them gives an equal list. There's more properties that I'm sure you could come up with. This is just some properties I came up with. So how does this help us? Um, you can't possibly test every single input of this function. So of course, the answer is to do a mathematical proof. I, I do apologize about my mouth. It's got, well, it's got a mind of its own today. Um, please put your hand up if you've ever done a mathematical proof of your code. Excellent, excellent. Um, who here actually cares about mathematical proofs of code? Who had to do them once at university? I went, ah, oh, I'll stick to being a software developer. Thank you very much. That's my, that's my kind of approach to it. Um, so yeah, mathematical proofs. Mm, I'd be good. I'd be lucky to write about ten lines of code a year if I had to prove them all work. So this is where, surprise, 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 property-based testing can come in, save the day like a lovely superhero. Um, I'm sure you're all very surprised that I would be standing up here talking about this. Oh, I didn't, I didn't lead up to this moment. So what is property-based testing? Oh, it's testing properties. <laughs> they are this that I'll read out again. For all x that satisfy some precondition, some predicate holds. So let's look at an example. So for list reversal, we'll say given a list of integers, if I reverse it twice, I get the original list. How are we going to do this? We're going to use a library called fscheck, um, which is a .NET library. It is called fs for f -sharp, but it's a .NET library. You can use it for C-sharp projects. Yes, you can use this for C-sharp. I know somebody's going to ask me right at the end, can I use this for C-sharp? But yes, you can use this for C-sharp. I am just using F sharp because I believe it is a far superior language. I know Kev disagrees, but it also looks nicer on slides. So this is what my property-based test looks like. First thing I do is I write a function that specifies the property. I always call mine check function because I'm a very creative individual. Then we specify what we are given as the inputs to the function. So in this case, I'm given a list of integers. Therefore, my property function takes a list of integers as its inputs. Next, you specify how to manipulate the inputs. In this case, I'm going to reverse it twice. So I just shove it into the F sharp list reversal function twice. And then I just assert using standard library assertions. In this case, I get the original list. So it should equal the original list. And then I just do the magic and I say, hey, FS check, can you just run it for me, please? And then you get some output, which is a nice green tick. We can all go home and be happy. So let's just 
have a look at what it's actually doing. Um, if we add a bit of logging into here, we can see what it's doing. So, okay, bit of a spoiler. It says here it passed 100 tests, so if anyone can guess what it's doing, well, congratulations, I guess. Um, if we just log the inputs it's generating, we can see here, so we start with an empty list, we start with a list of a single element, then we try with an empty list again. So the inputs start very small, and as we go on, they get bigger. And essentially, it's running, it's generating a load of inputs and running the code multiple times for various different inputs. So let's have a look at what happens when it's wrong, when the test is, when the property is wrong or something or other. So we're going to write property to say that reversing a list gives the original list. Clearly, it's not going to work for non-palindromic lists. So if I run this through FS check, it gives me a nice red cross. If I have a look at the output, it splats this, which can look a bit scary at first. But if you read through it, it tells you the very first input it generated to cause a failure. In this case, the list 0 and 2. If you reverse that, you get the list 2, 0. It also does something a bit magical called shrinking, which gives you the uh, minimal input to cause a failure. Um, oh, no. Go away. <laughs> You're not meant to come out yet. Oh, I do apologize. Anyway, so it shrinks your input, um, which, you know, it tries to find the smallest number, the shortest list, things like that. You could, if you wanted to investigate further, then plug those inputs into your function to say, oh, why is this not working as I expected? So it's not just a magical black box. It does actually tell you what it's doing. So you might be thinking, oh, this is neat, but oh my god, why do I need to test that list reversal is correct? And I'm just using that as a nice example here. Now I'll go through a few times when I've seen it in real life, or I've used it in real life, or places where you might want to use it in real life. So scenario number one is there's inherently some randomness in your code. So for example, I've written um, in my company, we've got a project called Bagel, which is essentially every week, it like randomly groups people up and says, you guys, you go coffee together. Um, people mostly don't do it, but that's another issue. Um, so as part of that code, we have something that takes an input list, and we want it to randomly remove a single element from the list and give us the rest of the list. How do you unit test this? You expect something different every time. The only way you can really have a deterministic unit test is to freeze like your random seed. But then what if, what if it doesn't actually work and it just happens to work for that seed variable? So this is where property-based testing can come in and save the day. So what you can say is you can identify a property such as, oh, sorry, this is the, uh, we're going to look at property-based testing for this. So this is what my uh, function signature looks like. So here it returns two values, an integer and a list of, int list of integers, which will be the rest of the list. And I can say something that I can't remember. Oh, yes. I can test that this code's work by saying, if I take the original list and I take the output, which is the removed element and the rest of the list, if I put them together, I should get the original list. So I can write property-based test for this. So just going through this quickly. So I take a list. I'm going to ignore empty lists for this. This will not work if we have nothing to return from the list. I'm going to call remove random. I'm going to get my two items. So the item removed, the remaining item. I'm going to shove them together using the list cons operator. And then I'm going to use this equivalent check, which is it's got the same items, possibly in a different order. And would you look at that? I've written a reliable unit test for code that's inherently random, which I can't really see of any other way of testing this, to be honest. So scenario number two is the solution is easy to verify, but hard to prove. So say, for example, you for some reason were writing your own sorting function for some reason. I don't know why. But you're there being like, how do you prove it works? And it's like proving that a sorting algorithm works is very hard. 
Um, I've never done it, but I can't imagine it's easy. But what you could do instead is just run it loads of times and verify the list is sorted that you get out. And you can do that by just going through each pair in turn and checking they're in order, which is what this does. So I take any list of input, any list of integers, I sort it, I generate the pairs which are using list.pairwise, which gives you, you know, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3. And then I just go through each one, check it's in order. And then, wouldn't you know it, I've not proved that my sorting algorithm works, but it's probably going to be OK. Scenario number three, which is you have an existing implementation to compare against. Who has ever been in this scenario where you have a lovely legacy function that's awful and makes you cry every time you look at it and you're like, I need to refactor this, I need to make it beautiful and shiny and not make me want to pull my hair out. Who's ever done that? Nice, most of you. Um, Property-based testing. Um, you can write a single test that just says, oh, just like generate inputs, shove them into there and check that you get exactly the same from the refactors than the legacy function outputs. This is a really great way of just checking for catching any edge cases you might not have thought about, like what if it's different for zero? What if it's different for minus one? What if it's all this stuff? And I personally have done this before and it saved me a lot of headache because I just did this. I've got a single test that's four lines long. It runs and it tells me everything that I've done wrong. And I'm like, oh my goodness me, this is brilliant. Scenario number, whatever number I'm up to because I've forgotten. Um, you've got forward, forward and reverse functions. Um, so if you are really lacking in anything fun to do outside of work like me and you decide to write custom serializers, so serializing an object into a string and back from a string, you can use property-based testing for this. Um, you can check that serializing and then deserializing the object gives you the original object. I have done this. I have written custom serializers and deserializers for something. Do not ask. I was incredibly bored. I did this. And the number of bugs that it found for things, it was incredible, especially for a test this size. Ah, oh, so good. Ah, oh, maybe so happy when it happened. Oh. Scenario number, the next one. Um, this is like, so I gave this talk to people at my company. I showed them this one. And this is the one that they like the best. This is the one they actually used. The nuclear exception finding option, which is literally just run your code and check those short check there's no exceptions. So if you have anything that might cause an exception in your code, this should catch it. And then you can be pretty happy you don't have any exceptions, anything that causes an exception in your code. Brilliant, isn't it? I think there's one more. Oh, there is one more. Only You might want to use it when only part of the range of possible outputs is possible. So if essentially, if someone is, or oh, sometimes it's easier to test that something's not wrong. So you might want to say, OK, I've got an absolute function. I want to test that. All you can say is like, oh, the absolute of a number should always be positive. You're not testing it's the right number. You're just testing that it's not the wrong number, which can be useful. Um, so an example is just the output should not be null, or it should always be a positive number. If someone is relying on this behavior, if someone's relying on this output being positive or not being null or anything like that, like it should probably be in a test as part of the specification. Put it in a test, it's dead easy. So as I said before, I did actually give a talk, this talk to my company previously about property-based testing. And after that, some people actually like took it away and used it. So I did a search across my entire organization for FS check and got 74 references. Then I think about four months later, I checked again and there were 129 references. So I am single handedly responsible for increasing the amount of property based testing in my company by 50%. Whew, what a claim to fame, am I right? Oh, anyone who's a front end developer, you're not safe either. Um, originally, I wrote this for .NET developers, and then I did this talk at NDC where they're not all .NET developers. And now I'm back in a room with .NET developers, so um, I possibly should remove this. But 
you can do this in JavaScript as well. There's a library called FastCheck. It does exactly the same, but it's in JavaScript. Um, I just wanted to highlight this. It's got a very interesting page called Issues Discovered, which shows issues they have discovered in really big libraries. So has anyone ever used Jest for testing front ends? It's quite a lot of you. Um, as of May 2019, 4 million downloads a week, uh, 25,000 stars on GitHub, quite a big library. Basically, anyone using React is probably using Jest. And um, they found an issue where to strict equals fails to distinguish zero from five times 10 to the minus 324. Who would have thought to write a unit test for checking that strict equals doesn't actually work correctly between zero and five times 10 to the three and minus, oh, whatever. You've also got this one, which I've read multiple times, and still don't entirely understand, but to equal is not symmetric for a set. So this is just demonstrating, it's not just you know me sitting in my room being like, property-based testing is great, that people are actually using it in the world and finding great amounts of use out of it. And if you, for some reason, are at a .NET meetup, but do not use .NET, um, it's, there's ones for every single language out there. So there's a Python one, there's a something else one, that's Haskell, Haskell's the OG one, uh, jQuick, the Java, uh, I've, I've forgotten which order they come in, there's like, C and there's, oh, uh, Ruby, C for some reason. If you're using C and you want to do property-based testing, you can. Um, PHP, again, why are you using it? But you can. Uh, Go, you can. Um, unfortunately, I know you're probably all thinking this, there is not a property-based testing library yet for BrainFuck. So if anyone wants to go write it, um, please send it my way because I would absolutely love it. So I've given this talk a few times. I've been asked a few questions. Uh, I'm just going to go over some of the questions I've been asked, which is, can I use this for complex types? Then it's great that I'm standing up here yelling at you about, oh, you look, you can test your integer lists. And you're like, I don't use integer lists. I use all my other things. Can I use this for complex types, such as you know objects? with other objects and with fields and blah, 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 blah. The answer is yes, with a really big asterisk, which is your mileage massively varies depending on your choice of language and framework. So just to compare and contrast, FS check for C sharp and F sharp is great for this. So because you've got runtime types and you've got all that reflection magic and all that stuff, like you can actually look into a type and figure out what fields you need to generate that type at runtime. So say, for example, I'm doing this really good physics simulation or something like this. I've got some object record. It's a record, I think. I've got some record type here. I've got another record type here. I've got some tuples. I've got a nested object. Um, I can shove this into a test as long as I put it in here. Um, FS check will generate it exactly as I expect. Um, uh, if I pause it in the debugger and inspect what it's generated, it's generated some very interesting values. So it's generated things like negative zero and negative infinity and five times 10 to the minus 324 has cropped up again because I assume that's the smallest difference in a double precision or something like that. So you might be looking at this and being like, oh my God, what the hell's going on? What is this junk data it is generating for me? And you might be like, oh, that's not good. But I hate to be the one to tell it to you, but because you're just using doubles here, technically minus infinity is a valid value for a double. By writing double here, you're implying that I can pass in negative infinity here. It's a valid value for a double. You might want to say, okay, well, this is a physics simulation, so I'm going to restrict my inputs. So I'm going to say that like the friction has to be between one and ten. The weight has to be between like a hundred and a thousand. But then by adding these restrictions in, like restricting your inputs, you're going to be kind of restricting. Oh no, go back, go back. So you're going to be restricting the uh, the kind of basically your confidence for what this works on. Um, so it's up to you really, like either you could do a different type for these, like you could say, rather than being a double, you could be like, oh, a nice double, 
which is between 1 and 10 or something. But remember that you're not going to be testing over as wide a range. Oh, look, you can watch him again. Um, so on the flip side, fast check, um, which uses, which is for JavaScript and TypeScript. So this, unfortunately, is not as good for it. One of the big problems with JavaScript is you don't have any runtime typing, basically. Uh, you just have objects. Everything's a fucking object, isn't it? Um, if you have an interface like this in TypeScript, um, unfortunately, if you want to use property-based testing with this, you basically have to rewrite the entire thing like this so that FastCheck knows how to actually generate this object at runtime. So obviously, if you're doing this, if you're finding value in this, like, yes, it's annoying to have to do this, but that's kind of a trade-off that you might have to think about. I mean, if you've got this moving item, chances are you've already got a unit test where you're already writing something like this out anyway, and you have to maintain it every time you add a field or anything like that. And uh, It's a never-ending battle, isn't it? So can I use this for complex types? Yes, but your mileage may vary. You in .NET land, you're absolutely fine. Um, Oh no, you weren't meant to be here. You were meant to be hidden away. Pretend this isn't here. A uh, question I got asked about five times NDC London. Can I use this for C sharp? And the answer is yes, you can. <sighs> this is what it looks like in C sharp. So it just doesn't look as nice to put on a slide, quite frankly. And F sharp is a superior language. I won't have any of that. Um, so yes, you can. It's a bit nastier. You've got to do all this kind of strange stuff. But yes, you can use it in C sharp. Are there any performance implications? Yes, no, sort of. It depends on what you consider performance to be, is uh, the short answer. Um, so of course, if you, uh, if you do more stuff, it's going to take more time. It's kind of a, you know, an immutable law of the universe, unfortunately. Um, running a test of 100 cases takes 100 times as long, question mark. Um, this is where I possibly will show myself up for knowing absolutely nothing about how the test runner works under the hood. But oh well, uh, I don't know how they work under the hood, mostly because I just don't care, really. Um, I've got better things to be doing, like writing custom serializers and deserializers, you know? So if you have these tests, so you've got some really useful tests here. This one, oh, look, true should be true. And then this one generates an integer and checks it's equal to itself. And then we can run it. And we can see what happens. And we can go, ah, that's not 100 times different. Um, I did run this multiple times. It was about 10 to 50 times slower for the property-based tests, which interestingly is not 100. Um, even better if you... Uh, look at how long it took to run these tests. It took 830 milliseconds, according to Visual Studio, um, even though it's only 251 milliseconds running the test. I won't have anyone telling me about Rider. I use Visual Studio. Opening this up, uh, apparently only the first test actually took any time at all to run. So I assume there's something either funky going on under the hood, or there's some optimization, or something like that. I don't really know, but I'm sat here being like, I don't really care, it's milliseconds. Like, that's the point of this bit. Um, so on the topic of performance, I'll whiz through this. Uh, you've got compiler errors, you've got runtime errors, you've got logic errors. Logic errors are the hardest find. That's when someone looks at your code and goes, hmm, this isn't quite the input that I was expecting. Whereas compiler errors are like, nah, nah, you can't do this. Bad, bad, red, big red squiggly. And you're like, oh, OK, easy to fix. <sighs> so OK. I absolutely love TypeScript. Um, TypeScript compiler is my favorite. Like, I love the language. I think it's fantastic in every way. Definitely nothing wrong with it apart from JavaScript. We'll ignore that. A horrible, horrible thing under the hood. Um, so in TypeScript, I've got a function that takes two numbers, A and B, don't matter what they are. Basically, I say, you've either got to give me both A and B or neither A and B. What I could do is I could just check them and throw and then do whatever I was going to do. Uh, 
but yeah, you can, you can read it. Interestingly, because this is a dark background, PowerPoint's actually figured out that this text needs to be white and this box needs to be black. Isn't that interesting? So when I write the code, I can write it like this. So we know right now that this is going to throw an error because you're only giving me one number. And TypeScript just looks at this and be like, eh, hey, good stuff. So you've got to write a test to this now. You've got to write a test that says, oh, if you give me one number, then I'm going to throw an error. Alternatively, what I could do is I could rewrite it so I can say that you have to give me both A and B in an object. You have to give them to me at the same time or not at all. So I'm wrapping up in an object and saying that object itself is optional. And now, these are the only two valid ways of calling it. So I can do either my funk but better with an empty object or my funk but better with both A and B. Notice that if I try and do this, if I try to only give one, TypeScript's going to sit there and be like, you can't do this, you've got to give me both. And why am I talking about this? Well, I don't have to write a test for this. And we all know the best code is no code at all. The fastest test to run will be no test to run. I don't have to test this because the compiler is going to catch it for me. So please lean on your compilers as much as you can. They are there to help you. They are your friend. Unfortunately, compilers cannot do everything. This is where the testing pyramid comes in. I'm sure you've all seen it. There's a bit of arguments about what on earth these words mean. Should we call them something else? But essentially, you've got your little unit test at the bottom, testing a single function, your integration test in the middle, that are testing something like an entire class or an entire app standalone, and then your end-to-end -end tests, which test the entire thing with real servers, real databases, real stuff, you know, real junk that just goes wrong all the time and gives you lovely red flakiness. And then I've put the little compiler at the bottom. It's like my unsung hero because, you know, your first line of defense is your compiler. Just to be clear, property-based testing lives in the unit test level, so it'll be working on different functions. Because unit tests are the quickest to run, running them 100 times is fine. End-to-end uh, -end tests, when they take, like, I don't know, a minute, running them 100 times, going to take an hour and a half, not ideal. And if you're writing code to release to production, it'll look something like this. You write your best... You write your code with your best friend, your compiler. You shove it out to a build server. Then you deploy it to your test stem, run your end-to-end -end tests, deploy it to production, hope nothing's on fire. Property-based testing will take effect here, so when you're running it locally, potentially on your build server. But the true power is that you can catch issues you didn't even know existed at this point before they can cause a fire in production. And I don't know about you, but production outages do not make my day better. So the question is, does test suite performance really matter? And I would say, maybe. No, until it does. You might have an issue where you, you come away from this talk and you're like, I am inspired, and I'm going to rewrite all of my tests to property-based tests and say it takes, I don't know, two minutes to run all your tests, and suddenly it's taking 20 minutes, like, that is an issue. If you're using this alongside traditional unit testing, then those extra milliseconds, quite frankly, don't matter. Um, you know, you're waiting for a build, you're going to get a coffee anyway, it doesn't matter if it takes a few milliseconds. To... So, last question, when shouldn't I use property-based testing? Um, I know you're all sat here being like, oh, I love property-based testing so much, I'm going to take it away. And I just don't want you to kind of look back on this moment and go, oh my gosh, what happened? What changed? I remember those days fondly. So, um, you know, everything is a gun and you're going to shoot yourself in the foot with it or something. I don't know what the saying is. So please do not do property-based testing when you don't have standard unit tests. Standard unit tests are much easier to understand. It's easy to look at an example and say, OK, I understand that the list 1, 2, 3 becomes 3, 2, 1. Please do not use property-based testing when standard unit tests are sufficient. So there may actually be cases where you can exhaustively enumerate all of your possible inputs, you know, like when you're using enums. 
don't bother using property-based testing. Just write a test for everything. Don't use property-based testing when you want to test a specific case. It might seem obvious. If you really want to test that 1, 2, 3 becomes 3, 2, 1, and you reverse it, then just use a standard unit test. Don't use property-based testing when you can't identify suitable properties. So this is the real hardest bit about property-based testing in the world is finding these kind of suitable properties. Um, one other issue that my company found in particular when trying to add it into production code was their models were not suitable. So in the example of the physics simulation where there were things like the wrong numbers were being generated, you kind of have to write your code in a way that you can actually property-based test them because you're going to be generating inputs. You might have to write in guards for everything to say, oh, only generate. I do apologize for my mouse. I don't know what it's on. You have to write guards being like, oh, but this number has to be between 1 and 10. This number has to be between 2 and 50, you know, things like that. And you end up kind of wasting loads of time just rewriting your models. Ugh. So. In conclusion, you'll be glad to know. I'm going to stop talking soon so we can go to the pub. Property-based testing is a technique for testing statements of the type for all x that satisfy some precondition then some predicate holds. It can give you confidence that your code behaves correctly across a wide range of inputs. It can help you find bugs in your code resulting from inputs you never would have thought to test. And last but not least, this technique can be used alongside existing unit tests. So with that, I will say thank you very much for listening to me yell at you. You've been a very lovely audience. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Um, when you say about, like, when it's generation based, if you take, for instance, that one million the velocity or whatever, and you want to constrain it, do you constrain it in the test library? And can you say, yeah, that's great, but don't give me anything outside this range? Yes, so um, so FS check will, uh, so the question was, um, can you, when you're constraining the, sorry, yeah, where, do you constrain where do you constrain the inputs? Um, so when FS check is generating a, an object of a specific type for you, like by default, it just uses reflection to like look in and pick things out. What you can do is you can actually specify how to generate the type. So you can say, um, for example, you could say, Oh, I want you to generate me a double that's even and between the values of 2 and 15 or whatever. And then you can say, take that number and then like map it into some other object with some other types. So I have done that. It does get quite onerous to be specifying these types all the time, but it is possible. Yeah. I mean, it probably makes sense. I mean, I was thinking about something simple like you were defining something that had an array, maybe a, a grid array. You don't want it to pass over the maximum integer twice, and you define that array in memory. Yeah. Oh, Jesus. Um, whereas you could say that the range, there's no specific range. It's not that we can't define an array bigger than 100, because 1,000 might work, 10,000 might work, but you don't want it to go and be totally stupid at it, because memory could be that big. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so, so, so essentially the, the question was um, when it generates things to like to, that are too big to, that might cause it to run out of memory. Um, so generally it doesn't tend to do that. So it won't tend to generate like lists that are like 100,000 long um, because then, yeah, you'll have issues with memory potentially. Um, so by default, it runs 100 times, and it makes everything bigger every time. It's got, it does have an actual reason what bigger means, but I don't need to chat about it here. Does, um, it, does, it, go on further on does it, would it interact with throwing exceptions? So say, for instance, if you decided that 1,000 is the biggest list that you could possibly do it with, mm -hmm. threw, a, threw an exception that would try and give it a list that's bigger, bigger than 1,000, can it automatically filter that out, or would you still have to say, don't even attempt to? Um, yes. Yes. So if you if you have an input above which um, it doesn't make sense, so say you've got an array that you know has to be under a thousand, uh, what you should do is generate your uh, generate your objects and tell FS check to never generate something over a thousand. Alternatively, what you should probably do in that case as well is 
generate only lists over a thousand in yeah. length and check they do throw. So you can, you can basically anything you can do in a unit test, you can do a property based testing. All it really gives you is the input generation and the ability to run it. Yes. Yes. Um, so the question was, um, can FS check take into consider attributes uh, put on fields? Um, I do not know the answer to that, but I would be very surprised if it doesn't. Um, if it's available to the compiler, not the compiler, if it's available via reflection, um, it should be able to do that. Alternatively, I'm sure there's somebody out there who has written some kind of, yeah, some kind of extension. Because yeah, if you do have something that says, yeah, uh, is it like a compiler? the attribute stuff, I wouldn't see why it can use that to generate these values for you. <laughs> if you're really bored and writing a custom serializer wasn't enough for you. I mean, I'll admit, I mostly work in TypeScript at the moment. I haven't ch touched FS check for quite a while. <laughs> Um, any more questions? Yes. So, what I'm struggling with is if you plot some random integer, like doing a test check, if you don't really know what the output should kind of look like, it's like an indeterminate struct that depends on what your input is, is it actually just something possible if you can't really use it in that kind of case? Um, yeah, so the, the question was um, if you're randomizing the inputs, uh, isn't the output like determinant, indeterminate? Um, so it can be. So one of the one of the issues with uh, property based testing potentially is that the code that you're writing to test your properties is as complex as the properties itself. Uh, sorry, yeah, that made sense. Um, that's why you've got to kind of look for these slightly more um, kind of abstract things. For example, the removing an item from the list. I'm not actually like um, I'm not kind of checking that, you know, if you give this list with this seed and get this output, like I know that I'm not going to know what the output is, but I can still state things that I know have to be always true. Uh, for example, if I remove a random item from the list, it had to be a part of the original list. So there's lots of kind of things like that, like finding these suitable properties can be very difficult, but they are worthwhile and they can help you understand like the kind of the specifications of your code. Yeah, yeah. For example, you might you might not want to test like the entire solution is correct, but you might want to test like say, oh, the item is always bigger than the item that you put in. Like the output's always bigger than the input. Like things like that. Like, if you write a program which is square the number, you would have to use the square function in your actual test to prove that the square function that you've written is the same. So I suppose things like that, you'd know that the number that's coming out of some of them that seems positive, you'd know that the number coming out should be bigger than the one that's Yes, that's yes. Um, so if you look on Wikipedia, at things like, like what is addition, what is multiplication, things like that, and you end up in like the horrible place of maths Wikipedia. Um, so it does actually have sections called like properties. So it'll tell you things like addition is commutative. So if you go, a plus B plus C, that's the same as like A plus B plus C, that kind of thing. Um, so there are like mathematical properties. So if for some reason you were writing your own addition function and had to actually prove that it was addition rather than just one plus one is two, um, this is kind of the approach you take. Um, I don't know why you do that because, you know, plus is there for us. Um, yeah, it's very interesting kind of actually figure out what these properties are, but I find it to be a very useful tool exercise. The work size. Sometimes you do use plus inside a class because you're defining, you know, if you have something like length and you're adding something to length, then you ask it, 
implementing Flask indirectly inside your Flask. So I suppose those things don't apply. Yes. So yeah, it's. The, the, I mean, the maths pro properties are like a bit, bit abstract, but quite interesting to look at, um, but not, not useful in your day to day. Um, did that answer your original question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, any more questions? Um, So if you wanted to test a specific value for a test, or? Uh, no, so the wrapper uh, sets out a specific value for user line function, so you, you can actually push the user line through to the user value input. Um, yeah, so you could, you could fix a, an input to your function if you wanted to. Yeah. Um, does, that, does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Did you ever do that? Um, I have never done it. I've tended to just okay. write them as is. Is it time for the pub? Thank you, thank you. Thank you for the